Cool. So we're in the middle of a series. Um, called, we're calling it the One Series. And what we're doing is we're really looking to identify the things uh, that unite us in this moment. Obviously, there's a strange cultural moment where people are arguing more than we've... I mean, almost more than we've ever seen about anything. It's just, you know, crazy what you're seeing on social media and in politics and all of that. Um, What we're orienting ourselves around this week is uh, similar to last week, is the idea of baptism. We as Christians share one baptism. Uh, Those of us who gave our hearts to Jesus uh, experienced this moment where um, probably you were gathered in front of your family and friends and a good number of people and you were dunked into a river or to a lake or, uh, you know, we've done it in Brent and Krista's pool. Um, and, and you go into the water. Somebody will say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You go down into the water and you come up out of the water. And that's really, uh, for us, just a very, very simple uh, way of dramatizing the story of the gospel. Uh, so we dramatize our identity with Christ in his death, that uh, we die to sin and we're set free from sin uh, as he has uh, died on the cross for us. And then when we are raised, we're raised to new life. We're raised uh, to identify with Jesus in his resurrection. And so what we're going to talk about today is what it means to identify with Christ in his resurrection. What does that mean for us? Uh, The passage we were working on last week was uh, Romans uh, 6. And just this verse 4 says this, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What does that mean? What does the resurrection of Jesus that happened in the past um, and the resurrection that we are to experience in the future, we'll talk about that, what does that have to do with our present? What is this walking in new life? What does uh, that mean for us? And the way we're going to look at it is we're going to go into some of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's an incredible theological uh, text in 1 Corinthians, and we're only going to scratch the surface of it. I want to pull a couple of ideas and just have us dig into this idea of where hope comes from and how this really works. So let's read together. Maybe we'll pray before we read our main text and, uh, and just ask the Lord to, uh, to speak to us. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. We are so grateful that we have uh, these letters, um, these stories, uh, these uh, poems uh, written down and saved and cherished and nurtured by scribes and scholars that we can look at them and we can say we are seeing the word of God to us. We're seeing Uh, the words that you want to speak to us. We can read them. We can have them on our iPhone. We're so amazed. Would you just let uh, this reading of the text be something powerful and transformative to us? Not just our intellect, but our hearts, Father. Would you uh, allow us to come under your word and be submitted to it and be transformed by it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Cool. So 1 Corinthians uh, 1, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and 23. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That need that Paul understood... Uh, and the need that the people in Corinth understood and the people that, of the ancient world understood to see death as an enemy and to hope that somehow death itself would be defeated um, is uh, a really important idea. Now, for you and me, we live in a way that is, compared to the ancient world, quite insulated from death. We live in a place that is quite safe. We live in a place that is uh, relatively easy. So I want to just maybe talk about Canada in 2021 with a cheery statistic that unites every single human being on the planet. You are all going to die. 
just thought you should know. A cheery thought from, uh, from well, statistically it's proven. Um, really, nobody is going to make it here. You're all just going to croak sometime. Um, and every one of us is actually experiencing uh, the power of death in lesser ways uh, in our lives. As Christians, as the kingdom of God breaks through, uh, we experience, you know, a foretaste of new life. We see some miracles happen around us. We see transformation happen around us. But, uh, the f- and the fullness of the kingdom of God will return. Um, but we, we do. We, we know what death tastes like. We know what it smells like. We know what it feels like. We're very good at medicating the pain of it and distracting ourselves from it with our abundance. But the reality is, it's all around us. There are people that we love uh, deeply who have things that are wrong with their heart and their lips go blue sometimes. And we watch this with pain because uh, we love them. There are people with failing joints. I have a nephew in cancer treatment. Uh, there's COVID. Uh, there are old eyes. Do any of you do this with your phone, trying to read on there what it says, right? Um, the reality is there's mental illness, there's PTSD, and the list goes on and on and on. There's the grief and loss of people that we love moving away and leaving us behind. There is a way that death is something that if we are honest about it, and if we take a second to dwell on it, there's a way in which it's real. It's a ravening beast that is coming to devour every one of us. Is anybody cheered up yet? What radically distinguishes us as Christians, though, and unites us from the rest of the world is that we have something. We've been baptized into a surety of hope that there is something beyond all that. It's been incredible walking over the last number of years uh, through the journey of my friends uh, Jesse and Lisa Britton. Jesse and Lisa are a ministry couple. They live in Stratford, Ontario. Uh, Jesse was my assistant when I was a pastor in Toronto. Wonderful, energetic young man, beautiful wife, beautiful family. It was wonderful to be at their wedding and wonderful to watch uh, their, their, their children being born. Uh, there were one child, Asher, though, was born with a heart defect. And just days after his birth, this beautiful little infant experienced open heart surgery. He uh, had subsequent surgeries. And when he was just still a little boy in the hospital in the middle of one of those surgeries Asher went to be with the Lord Uh, we have sitting in our foyer right now uh, a bag of Asher's shirts that my wife Anna is going to make into a quilt and with our love for this couple we can barely open this bag of shirts to see um, what this little boy wore to create something as a memorial for his parents how do you get through that as a parent? How do you get through that as a person? How do you do that as Jesse? How do you take a stone and write your son's name on it to place it uh, in front of your aunt's grave? Because that's where he's buried waiting for Asher's stone to be carved. How do you do that? And how do you do that and become a person who is still invested in ministry and still a world changer? How do you do that and become a person who has not become bitter, who has not become closed off, who has not given up on life, but is actually living life in a radical way, serving God? How does that happen? And if you ask Jesse and Lisa that question, what they will say to you unequivocally is that they believe the resurrection of Jesus is for Asher. It speaks of something that will happen to him. That he will experience resurrection as a young believer. It will happen to Jesse and Lisa. They're only following Asher uh, a little bit behind. And it will happen to you and me, to all who put their trust in Jesus. Jesse's currently the director of a YFC mission in uh, southern Ontario. And for him, that's what evangelism means is to tell this story of the coming resurrection of his boy because of his hope in Jesus. So here's a question, maybe a statement. Uh, I believe that God wants every Christian, I believe God wants every believer to be united by a shared hope. 
that the death we experience here in this life is not the end of the story. And that should unite us more than anything that, that threatens to divide us. So there's a question, is the fear of death and the experience of death in your life and around you either overwhelming and discouraging you or is it just causing you to medicate the pain of it and to live inside yourself? Or could it be possible that a fuller connection with this idea, trust and understanding that this hope belongs to you, the hope of Jesus' resurrection is for you, is there a chance that this could transform your life and cause you to see the world differently and to live in a different way? We're going to talk about two of those different ways in the next couple of minutes. Um, this first idea I want us to wrestle with is our belief in the resurrection is meant to translate into radical risk-taking and mission-focused living. Our belief in the resurrection is meant to translate into mission-focused living. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, um, 30 to 34, Paul has sort of given his case for the resurrection. He's talked about the witnesses. He's unpacked some of it. But then he comes uh, to some practical application. And in 1 Corinthians 30, 34, he says this, Why are we in danger every hour? I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let's just eat and drink, and tomorrow we die. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Paul's not pulling any punches here. Paul is choosing, because his understanding, his belief in the resurrection, to literally face death every day. When we go back to the book of Acts chapter 19 and we see his interactions in Exodus, he's preaching the gospel in a radical way that is actually causing uh, the, uh, an economic shift in the culture. Uh, in that area, they were building all kinds of idols, silver idols. There was a silver mine nearby. It was the wealth of Ephesus producing silver idols to be transported all over Asia Minor. And in that space, Paul is preaching the gospel and just coming to people and saying, hey, that idol is just silver, it's just dirt, it's nothing. Uh, let's worship Jesus. I mean, we don't usually do that to businesses in our local town. We probably uh, run into problem with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but, but he's like being upfront, like people are getting saved, people are leaving their idols behind, the price of silver is tanking, and the work for idol makers is gone. And riots are starting, and they're literally going into this Colosseum place. They're dragging Christians in there. Uh, it's a theater, uh, not like the Roman Colosseum, a full circle. I think we have a picture of it. Yeah, it's a half circle. It's a theater. And they have animals there, and they're going to just, for people's entertainment, eat anybody they don't like. Here, watch this lion eat this guy. We don't like him. He broke the law. He stole stuff. And they're dragging Christians in there, and Paul uh, is, is you know, going through all of that interaction and taking all of that risk. Is there a chance that we could choose risk over comfort? Maybe just a little bit like Paul. I don't think there's lions. In, I don't think Chamber of Commerce keeps those around. Um, but is there a chance that we're called to a life of higher risk to proclaim and speak the gospel? Uh, we're doing exactly the opposite in the danger of COVID. Uh, did you know that you can buy... Um, you, can, you can be part of the emergency preparedness market, which is a $10.5 billion market that almost doubled during COVID. Do you know that for $8,995, that's on sale, it's regularly $10,995, uh, you can buy 36 buckets with grab-and-go handles of food that has uh, got a 25-year shelf life, just in case. You can buy that in Canada. You can, you can order that online today if you want. Anybody going for their phones? You can spend an enormous amount of time and energy to protect and to preserve your life just in case something is happening. But more concerning than prepping is the way that we medicate our fear of death. Not just trying to avoid death, but medicating the fear of death and the pain of death that we're walking through. Uh, during COVID um, in Ontario... 
uh, the, the sales of alcohol in the first four months of the pandemic went up by $250 million year over year. $250 million more booze sold in the first four, four, first four months of COVID. Canada-wide, $1.6 billion in the first year of the pandemic. Pot sales in Canada were $118 million higher than projected in the first year. When death knocks at our door, we run from it, we fear it, we medicate it, we go to substances, we go to Amazon, to shopping, to Netflix. I'm always picking on poor Netflix. But we go to all of these places to somehow distract ourselves from the reality that something bad might be happening around us, that something bad might be happening to us. And Paul says to us, wake up from your drunken stupor. Do not go on sinning, for there are people out there that have no knowledge of God. Well, we build our bunkers and medicate our fear. There's a question. If you really believed that the baptism of Jesus, uh, your baptism into Jesus, meant that the resurrection of Jesus was for you, and that there was eternal profit, like Paul did all of this uh, because there was gain. If you did all of this because there was profit in spending your time, your money, your energy, and your living, your life for the gospel, if you believe that in your heart, how would that change the decisions you've made in the last six months and the decisions you might make in the next six months to come? How would that change it? I believe that if we begin to see his resurrection as not just a self-contained event, we begin to really believe that it's something for us. It is going to change those decisions. Not only will we live lives uh, more generous and more free, uh, we're going to live lives uh, that are joyful in the midst of the darkness that we have to face that's all around us. That's the second idea. If we believe that the resurrection of Jesus is meant for us, we'll have peace in the darkest moments. We'll have peace in the most difficult moments of facing death in life. Uh, in that first text we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just that one verse, verse 19, it says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all we are of all people most to be pitied. What he's saying here is that, you know, if Jesus was just a great moral teacher, and he was a great moral teacher, if he was just someone who gave us some suggestions about how to live life, if he was someone who just gave us some life hacks uh, to greater happiness, which is often how the gospel is preached in these days, Jesus is there to just make you have a better life. If that's all that there was to faith, if that's all that there was that we were receiving from Jesus, we would, we would be the most to be pitied. We would have nothing. We would be like every other uh, religion on the planet. What Paul is saying is that we need something more than life hacks. We need something that is going to help us endure uh, the dark moments of life. We need something that is going to actually tangibly and really, truly defeat death. We need to have the hope that that defeat of death will happen for us. We said in the intro, we see the pain of death all over around us. Uh, people we know who have uh, weak hearts, people whose hips aren't working, people who need surgery, people who are going through chemo treatments. We have a long list of pain that happens to us and a long list of death that we cause uh, by our decisions in the lives of others. And it's incredibly beautiful as the moral teaching of Jesus is, it still doesn't answer that question of death. Something has to have happened that will ultimately make a difference in the end. And so I want to just read to us uh, so that we can see a little glimmer of hope, a little bit of what the Bible tells us about the future that's before us. I just want to read a little bit from Revelation chapter 20. Just a taste of the end of the story. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 says this, and this is just a picture of what 
will be. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. So present that uh, the tangible realities that were experienced just fled from the true reality of his presence. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. A scary thought for us. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So bring thought, echoing 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. If you can see whenever this is to be in the future and however this is to look, if you can see this as the reality that is more real uh, than the heaven, the sky, and the earth that will just fade away with no place for them to land because of the reality of heaven in your mind's eye. If you can see this new life with Hades and death destroyed, having been defeated. If you can see this life with a new Jerusalem uh, coming from heaven with God dwelling on earth with his bride. With our groom wiping every tear from our resurrected eyes. Does this hope change how you live in your present? Does this hope change how you spend your money? Does this hope change who you invest your time in? Does it change how you'll live through a bad day at work? Does it change how you'll live through the griefs of life? It does. It has to. We need this hope. I want to paint one more picture for us as we close. This is from the story of the Lord of the Rings. I think many of you are familiar with either the movies or the book. And one of the most poignant moments in that book, uh, for me, is out of the journey of Sam and Frodo through Mordor. And they're taking the ring uh, from, you know, uh, that needs to be destroyed. And they're walking into the darkest place in Middle Earth uh, to get it destroyed. And they are hungry, and they are thirsty, and they are tired on their mission. They are weary, they are broken down, and they are almost destroyed. And at this point in the journey, they sort of crawl uh, for a little rest into a little hollow. And the story picks up like this. There was a bitter tang in the air of Mordor that dried the mouth. When Sam thought of water, even his hopeful spirit quailed. Beyond the Morgai, there was the dreadful plain of Gorgoroth to cross. Now you go to sleep first, Mr. Frodo, he said. It's, It's getting dark. I reckon this day is nearly over. Frodo sighed and filled with his own weariness, and he took Frodo's hand. And there sat silent till deep night fell. Then at last, to keep himself awake, he 
crawled from the hiding place and looked down. The land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sly noises, but there was no sound of voice or foot. Far above the Ethel Dueth in the west, the night sky was dim and pale. And there, peeping among the cloud rack, above a dark, for high, far high up in the mountains, Sam saw a single white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart. As he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope, returned for him. For like a shaft clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was really only a small and passing thing. Now for a moment, his own fate and even his master's ceased to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself at Frodo's side and putting away all fear, cast himself into a deep and untroubled sleep. If we come to believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is for us, you can sleep a sleep of peace in the darkest place of your life. You can sleep on the hardest mission of your life. And for me, that is my prayer for myself, and it's my prayer for you, that the nights of wrestle, the nights of struggle, the nights of wondering uh, what to do will be broken into by a shaft of light, knowledge of the resurrection that is to come, knowledge of Christ's victory over death, and you'll be able to live a hopeful, missional, enduring person for him and for his kingdom. That's what hope we share together.